Hello and welcome. I'm sitting here with Sean Dacey for the new Center of Research and Practice and TBA 21 Academy. And I would like to ask you one question. Is, do you think it's possible for the art world to develop a second a tier system of that is not funded by the rich and powerful? Or is it completely out of line? To ask some a question like that is there can we develop a modality where we can at least try to go away in certain aspects of art wow big question yeah uh, I feel there are potentials but I don't see currently I don't see a way of, of disconnecting you know uh, the, f the funding by nationalist entities or corporations or um, uh, rich patrons who may um, make their money in very exploitative ways. Um, but I do, th I do see opportunities or potentials for kind of experimentation on how, like moving away from um, relying on those or maybe there's ways to um, take money in certain ways but uh, be critical about um, the people who are funding um, yeah that's a dip I need a secondary question to like get go deeper on this yeah uh, I, I, some, I sometimes see that uh, museums try to establish new bonds with new communities mm -hmm. by building on programs that foster uh, non-art interchange inside of our exhibitions mm -hmm. and exhibition spaces like to giving the exhibition space for time as a, for, as a council meeting or a workshop that helped the, the locality and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was thinking about potentials that uh, arrive out of communalities and regionalities that could potentially uh, be a new grounding for a non-centralized, meaning non-hierarchical, uh, coming from nation state, coming from rich mm -hmm. funders, mm -hmm. but really like sourced, more like the origin of the uh, uh, self-organized uh, art centers yeah, that yeah. are already now also like completely addicted to fundings, like the characters in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's something that we are grappling with in Canada because we have this um, artist-run scene. Um, so many galleries uh, were initiated, uh, artists just gathering together, having a studio space, and then opening up a gallery in the front um, and just finding ways of keep paying rent and keeping the spaces open. But as time has went on, these spaces professionalize, um, they fundraise, they, uh, uh, they get public funding, and then they become these institutions. Um, but now we're seeing, because the, those funding models are fairly closed, new, new galleries that are starting or new organizations are really thinking more from a social enterprise perspective, an entrepreneurial perspective, and thinking a bit more of like unique ways to operate as businesses themselves. So. Um, one thing that a lot of galleries have is space and a lot of space is very expensive in like a place where I live like Vancouver so like what you say a potential can really be around this idea of sharing your space or collaborating or partnering or or making use of that in different ways whether at you know throwing a party hosting an event for someone else um, and so it, it actually builds things out in, in a different way that, you know, a lot of these artists run centers in Canada are really exclusively for curators and other artists. But in more unique situations where it's more of a social enterprise, 
it's more partnerships with maybe non-arts organizations. You end up having, you, uh, you, uh, on top of finding different funding sources, you also encounter different audiences in different situations. And I see a lot of potential in um, sort of expand, in expanding out of the limited network of the art world um, and I think artists are also interested in working in those contexts where they're engaging with a different situation than what they're used to. So, um, yeah, no, I think that kind of thinking is, is, is very exciting. And also not relying upon um, public funders. And uh, in Canada, a lot of the galleries do like art auctions where it's, you know, invite the richest collector to buy a bunch of art and you get, you know, 50% of the profit. Um, thinking of other ways to uh, make money that allows you to do what you want to do. Um, but yeah, in Canada there's these fine lines between commercial and uh, non-profit or like more like uh, academic spaces. Um, and in Canada we like to draw this line so there's kind of pushback as far as being too, operating too much like a business. But I think we need to think more entrepreneurially um, and think about social enterprise and uh, uh, move away move away from relying upon the go-to uh, sources, especially when they stand against who we are uh, as people, as 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 uh, uh, with our own politics and our 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 view of the world. Yeah, I see galleries who are often seen as like complete capitalist uh, entities and therefore like entities that are uh, outside of the, uh, the, the art critical market and as if they could do whatever they wanted. I see them more like, like newspapers that have to get certain advertisements inside their, their paper and if they, let's say, uh, a gallery has uh, like 15 uh, big buyers every year and three of them are from a certain kind of field that is quite not interested in, in having uh, environmentalist artists inside of the thing yeah, like yeah. because the CEO of Shell and, and certain things they would say no then going to stop buying there. So I see, see it rather as an analogy to the publishing houses who will then say, I'm not going to publish that. I'm not going to have this piece. I'll do it. It's a nice piece. I'll do it. It's a nice and amazing artist and I really like to foster this, this progress. I, will, I can't do. Mm -hmm. So I think even the, the gallery is in a way only sustained by larger capitalist interests that then filter out the possibilities of such a mm -hmm. gallery. So in the end, we end up, at least in my view, in a similar system as in the project space that goes and is approached by BMW and then has to decline or say yes, but then they, they can't like do uh, uh, sessions about how bad it is to drive cars and we should only walk anymore. Yeah. Because then you would lose the funding. So I see even I see them on, on, on different areas, but they are still bound by the same strict, so to speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I th I think uh, maybe there is a, a possible third way, but this this third way ha would would need to be developed alongside. Uh, existing funding mm -hmm. and existing uh, uh, government abilities. No, yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting in the context of Canada, we don't have a big art market. Um, these big corporations, they'll fund like the large museums, but most, most of the mid-sized galleries are not in that game. The game we encounter is really the political game where our, where our funding comes from municipal, provincial, and federal uh, systems. And then they come with their mandate of what kind of projects they want to support. 
um, and they really front line things that align um, you know to the positive values that they're trying to project into the world to cover up their what they actually do in certain ways um, so it's this game of like how how do you navigate that get the money um, and the money is very good so I think a lot of institutions are afraid of taking that leap um, to try something different. And there's a few spaces that have attempted to detach a bit more from that and to not rely, but um, it's still very kind of early days. And I think where it is successful, it, it does come out of this um, more uh, semi-business oriented, um, microfunding sort of idea of like a way that people can come in and purchase something or um, support the gallery and a uh, institution in a different way but I also think it also involves getting out of simply showing uh, like contemporary capital C contemporary visual art all the time and I think it it pushes these organizations to think outside the box and really consider what their programming is. And, and I think, yeah, that programming can also uh, play into uh, developing those sorts of models as well. Yeah. And maybe it's also not about being so, um, so separated as institutions. Like, you know, Vancouver isn't a big city um, and maybe all these we don't have to all fight over the same uh, pot of money and maybe there's ways of uh, working together to um, uh, raise funds or be more entrepreneurial together versus always being so separate and almost like uh, in certain ways in competition with each other when we're trying to be a part of a ecosystem of some kind yeah so I think about that too of um, ways of uh, partnering and collaborating and doing things together. Like a lot of the times there's, in Canada, there's not a lot, enough money to do a project on the level that you want to do it. So usually you end up um, partnering with many other organizations to make something happen, which I find can be really fruitful and actually engage a larger audience that you may not actually engage with. So. Yeah. They're all kind of, everything's kind of interconnected, yeah. I think, I think a lot of art uh, places lack this interconnectedness mm -hmm. with, with their surroundings and with the possible populace that could go there. Uh, I always understood art as a place of possibility mm -hmm. and not only about aesthetics and I also think that aesthetics has, to, has mostly be seen as something that you can hang on the wall mm -hmm. or a performance that is durational mm -hmm. but not uh, social uh, aesthetics and aesthetics of mm -hmm. engagement and of possibility of knowing that you can go to an art house or a museum and say I'm from an underrepresented uh, part of this world. I live around the corner and we, ha we are like making up 30% of this community that is around there. Is it possible to, to foster something, that to, to create some interchangement? And I, I, I see this very, very rarely. I had like a short uh, uh, seminar where, uh, uh, where one of the guests was uh, Charles Esche mm -hmm. and he told me that they are creating new, new possibilities where they are engaging with the direct populace around and because of that I, I started to think because maybe uh, it is possible somehow to, to branch out of this Greenbergian avant-garde idea back to, uh, because before that in the 1910s and 1920s, mm -hmm. it was kind of more uh, open. Mm -hmm. Although we could say that that is was amateurish, you can't make a cookout in a museum, it's like, oh my god. Oh well, yeah, it's my, it, it, it's my, I have, you know, I went to curatorial school, I love curating 
shows, projects, but I really want to move away from the auth that kind of controlling authorship and control of a space and you know I run I run a municipal gallery that's in a community center in in next to a library random people walk in all the time they don't understand what's happening at first and instead of like taking control like my vision controls that space it seems really limited like why would I why would I want to do that? Um, it seems more productive, or there's more potential in like, if other people are interested or sharing that platform or um, using that space in different ways, I think it helps on all levels, whether it's um, raising money, building audience, creating a, a, a dynamic curatorial program, um, I think it's that control of the curatorial that's been preached to us for, you know, 50, 60, 100 years um, that we need to start questioning and breaking down more, uh, more often, yeah. Because it's also, I mean, I guess it's also exciting people, you know, you get a job um, programming a space, you have all these ideas, um, but if they're not connected into the context of like where you're working or if there's like you know it's not gonna uh, I don't know how dynamic it's gonna be like it's like uh, uh, what is that line you know a tree falling in the forest was no one's there did anyone hear it yeah and I think that can happen a lot in 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 spaces too yeah I was. Uh, I'm currently developing the idea of of a history of 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 of, uh, of, of creation, in which I see that mm. creation starts out with an idea of creation, creating objects, commissioning objects mm. to a creation of ideas, and now we are more and more seeing glimpses of a creation of so socialities of social solutions. Mm. As, as naive some of these might be, I still see it as a new uh, model that is more and more influencing the, the other uh, previous models that are still existent and are, are grounding, so to speak. But I, I, I see it more and more that there is a, a shift, I wouldn't say like uh, awake or something, but it's, it's like mm -hmm. I see that there is, you can see it sometimes there and there in the world where they, uh, things that would not have been possible as a thought are slowly generated and, and, and driven beyond the experimental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting perspective. I, I feel that the the things that I've seen in Venice that are innovative and dynamic and interesting really do consider that curation of the social space um, versus um, the curation of objects within, within a space. Um, and the ones that are more focused on the objects are just fall flat and are sort of, sort of dead. Um, in a lot of ways, so I, that, I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about uh, um, the ways the ways we curate um, and needing to move out of simply thinking about placing objects and really thinking about socially how that space is 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 going to work. And I don't know, maybe it's something about. Uh, the way we engage with art. Like if we just want to engage with an object, we can just look at Instagram. And I think there's really a, cr uh, a craving for sociality and experience and um, having a curated social experience um, that I think a lot of uh, people are experimenting with. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Because you I want to read that. <laughs> <laughs> because you also see it in non-art spaces, meaning these mm -hmm. mystery places where you go in and then you experience a non-art experiential yeah. place where you have yeah. to find this and that. 
And if you just describe it in 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 just pure academic uh, mm -hmm. terms, so that people will not realize that it's art, it sounds like an artwork. It sounds like an artwork at the Biennale. Ten years ago, you go into this space and then you have to find that and there are like clues there and there and then everything is like, every object is like created for this space. It just sounds exactly like, like an art work and I think like there is a general dimension in, in, in the social sphere uh, of humanity that strives more for interactivity between humans mm -hmm. than for interactivity between two mediums, the eye of the human and the object or the video or the performer mm -hmm. or, the, or the sound. I mean, mm -hmm. It's all interacting my body somehow. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, like even there's an installation here where it's, sim it's simply uh, spiders making webs and for a second I thought of just how cheesy or lame that is, but then seeing people um, engaging with it and being mystified by actual, that, oh, it's actually spiders making webs, like after a day of like walking through like austere formalist art, um, I think just setting up that social frame and that interaction with the natural world um, really amazed people in this weird way so versus whether i like the piece or not it it created it created something that really sparked people more so than uh, a series of uh objects on a shelf or yeah so <laughs> thanks a lot great yeah. lot for that interview we'll leave this bench for friends the spiders <laughs> and we'll see us all soon to the next interview. <laughs>